I can't tell you how honored and pleased I am to have as our guest today uh, Billy Whitliff. Uh, he is going to, is a recipient of our first um, Distinguished Speaker Award, and uh, it is a medal that will is being cast right now of the only coin ever commissioned by the state legislature in 1909 uh, and awarded to the last survivor of the Battle of San Jacinto. So he will get a replica of that. Uh, I had to tell him it's silver, not gold, where he couldn't afford the gold. Uh, and but, it's uh, a replica, he tells me now. <laughs> <laughs> well, there'll be a limited edition, all right. <laughs> but let me say that uh, I have had the pleasure of knowing Billy Whitliff uh, since our college days together. And, and there's no person on this landscape of Texas that I have more respect and admiration from than or for than him. And they say, you heard this a thousand times, I always cringe when I hear it, this man needs no introduction. <laughs> Well, then why are you up there, stupid O? <laughs> I thought that was your purpose. Well, he is probably true in many cases. They don't need an introduction, but they deserve one. And Billy Whitliff deserves the greatest introduction any person could possibly give. But he's going to get it today from me. <laughs> because he, well, let me tell you why. Because really, I'm going to be very brief about the introduction because he's going to introduce himself to you in a way that you probably never heard him profile himself. You've heard distinguishing things about him. You may have caught some commentary, but we're going to discuss Billy's life, which let me say he has consistently done with a high degree of excellence. Everything in life that he has chosen to put his hand to. And he only got better with age. Not because he was any smarter or any more talented, but simply because he had the experience to bring to the subject matter. And he's excelled as a student in school. He's one of the only people I know that went to high school and, and college at the same time. And he was captain of his football team. He was raised in a small town in Texas. And I can say as far as he has gone, as much as he's traveled around the world, he never left in his heart that small town. And he has been a brilliant um, at crafting books. That was his first cho chosen profession in a book publishing company he established called the Encino Press. He was incentivized or inspired in many ways by Carl Herzog, called the printer at the pass who lived in El Paso. And Billy truly replicated Carl's genius in the books he, he fashioned over his years as the editor of, and the publisher and the writer in many instances of those publications. And they're highly collectible and now have become very rare. He was greatly influenced in that early part of his life by J. Frank Doby. And his first publication, I believe I'm correct in saying it was his first, was called Bob Moore, Man and Birdman which he talked Doby into letting him per, uh, publish uh, under the Encino Press in Pertur. And it's, it is the rarest of his efforts in, in, that, uh, in that venue. He then segued into a life as a screenwriter and uh, movie producer, as we all know about Lonesome Dove, but also you may not know he also wrote the script for The Perfect Storm and did one of my favorite movies, The Legend of the Fall. So. A, f a fabulous uh, portfolio of accomplishment there, but also he's a great photographer. He's done several books in that regard. He captured probably one of the last great cowboy vaquero uh, historical moments when he went to a remote ranch in Mexico and showed these cowboys cowboying as they did in the old days without the help of modern machinery and the likes. And also he even went so far uh, in Mexico is to stop at the Bordellos uh, in Laredo and did a book and felt so moved by what he saw there that he, he published a book on that subject. <laughs> I said what he saw there. 
<laughs> but uh, let me say clearly that Billy Whitliff is a man for all seasons. And I think you're going to get an in-depth look at that when we continue our conversation here today. For me, as Robert Reagan said, who was uh, the Postmaster General of the Confederacy when he was addressing um, the men of Hood's Texas Brigade at an anniversary, he said, there is no greater honor that could be bestowed on me in life than to say I served in Hood's Texas Brigade. And I can say to all of you today, there would be no greater honor that could be bestowed on me to say that somehow in my life, I served importantly in the causes of Billy Whitliff, a great, great man, and thank you. Uh, thank you. Now, I gave Billy a little profile of what I thought would be a, could be of interest to you, but we may change it as the script goes along, but I thought we'd start off with the beginnings of his life. Because I said, as I said earlier, I don't think any of us ever get too far away in life from where we grow up. So Billy, how about life in South Texas and mom and the telephone company? So I was born in Taft, Texas. Uh, and I'm gonna just be straight with you. My father was a toilet hugging drunk. And after two years, I had an older brother, but after two years, mother decided that it was just going to be downhill all the way if she stayed with my father. And mother had no money. She had no education. She had nobody to help her. She had two little boys. Uh, let me mention now, my brother um, became a molecular biologist and has lectured all over the world and done truly wonderful things in the in the field of science. But anyway, mother grabbed the two of us and um, went to my father's family and said, he's in trouble with liquor and if you, you don't do something, it, it's gonna be very bad. And, and they basically said, well, you married him, you know, he's your deal. But, but she left, thank God. And um, she got a job running the little switchboard this is during World War II, in Gregory, Texas. It, I wrote a movie about it called Raggedy Man with Sissy Spacek and Sam Shepard and so on. Um, but mother ran that little switchboard 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. She got $30 a month. $5 of that was to also be the janitor. Uh, Gregory, of course, is near Corpus. There were a lot of blackouts. When there were blackouts, Jim and I would put sleep on a pallet under the switchboard. Mother would pull down black shades and work that switchboard all night and then all day. Um, the whole, it was, a, I mean, I'm, I'm not complaining. This was, a, this was the perfect childhood for somebody who might want to try writing uh, because the whole world came through that door. It was during World War II. If somebody's son was missing in action, the call came to our house. And then mother knew where the people who had telephones lived. And she, if, if the person that she was wanting to get in touch with didn't have a phone, then she knew the farmer to call three miles away or two miles away or wherever who did have a phone and she would call that person and say can you get hold of the Myers because they have a call coming from Washington and then the whole family would come over to our house there was a pay phone in the front room uh, which is you know 10 by 10 something like that and they would get on the phone and sometimes the news was that they had lost somebody in action um, and they would cry and then sometimes they would get the news that somebody that they, they thought or who indeed had been a prisoner of war uh, had been freed and then they would cry 
And for a little kid, like my brother and me, I mean, whatever the sound was, crying and so on, it was the same, whether they lost somebody or they gained somebody. And so it was the, it was a, a weird thing. But the whole world came through that house. Uh, day and night. I remember when I was out on the front porch and this pickup pulled up and there was a Mexican man with a little boy about four or five just screaming bloody murder. And he had stuck his hand under the house to get a rubber ball and a rattlesnake had hit him. And so they had called mother and she called a doctor in Corpus Christi and told the man with the baby to come to our house. He did. She could speak Spanish. She went out and said, go toward Corpus Christi, you know, and wave your hand out the window until somebody waves back and stop. That'll be a doctor. And and anyway, so. um, But, you know, uh, what a blessing to have seen life that close to the bone from such an early time. We moved from there to the telephone office in Edna. And I was, I guess, five or so. Your, your mother had married again, right? No, when you moved to Edna? no, not. Oh. She hadn't married yet. So we moved to Edna. Uh, she ran the telephone office there. She had help. Uh, we lived in the telephone office. Uh, my brother was in first grade. I was just scooting around. But I started going to the hardware. It was run by a wonderful man named Westoff. And he was a wonderful storyteller. And he would tell me stories. He would do two things. He'd give me old boards and nails, and he would tell me stories. And he told me a story about the wild woman of the Navidad, who was an escaped slave who lived in the Navidad River Bottoms. And the farmers and the ranchers for years tried to catch her. And they would find her tracks in the river bottom mud. And anyway, they never could catch her. But then for a while, they found her tracks in the tracks of a little child. And then after a while, they found her tracks, but the tracks of the child disappeared. And that just broke my heart. I'm sure because I felt like a waif myself. But it was powerful, powerful, powerful. And and I started paying attention to stories that were coming out of my own piece of ground. Um, years later, uh, we moved to Edna. And one Christmas, uh, an aunt who was working in Joskies in Houston sent me a book, a J. Frank Doby book, for Christmas. And the third or fourth story in that book was the wild woman of the Navidad. <laughs> and I'm telling you, it set me afire. I mean, it had never occurred to me that a book, a book could come right out of my own experience, right out of my own piece of ground. And I mean, it just, it lit a fire uh, that's still burning. And everything I've had the good fortune to do, uh, relative to books and stories and so on, comes out of that moment of, of getting that book. Um, go ahead if you want to. <laughs> no, I mean, your mother then married again, and you said that your next father was a mean little shit, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I said a mean little son of a bitch. <laughs> um, but he was a, a, a wiry little cowboy. Um, this, was, this was, we were living in Edna. Um, my brother was a, became a scientist, as I said, a molecular biologist. And Jim was interested in butterflies and red ants and things like that. I, I was interested in anything that meant trouble. And uh, so he liked me. He didn't like my brother so much. Um, but, I, I, again, what a, what a lucky thing, you know, to have all this stuff right in front of you. They got married. Um, we moved from Edna to Brownsville. Uh, this is actually just before they got married. And Mother became 
the evening chief operator in Brownsville. And we lived in a little uh, addition, they used to call them, uh, that was built right after World War II for uh, veterans. Um, right on a Rosaka, you know what a Rosaka is, it's a piece of the Rio Grande that's been cut off and it just leaves kind of a little, a little creek lake kind of deal. But it was wonderful fun. Um, answer me, Let's yeah. go, because I'm going to get stuck here. No, that, that I was just uh, trying to say that the, your, your experiences there with your mother uh, and your father, you're in the second father, he were, or liked you because you did all of the mail kind of things. And yeah. He was uh, useful, or he thought were useful in life. But at the same time, you were quite, a, you demonstrated quite a bit of leadership skill. You were uh, captain of your football team, or you were certainly the quarterback, right? This is in Blanco, yeah. This is after you moved from Brownsville. Brownsville, and my mother married the wiry little cowboy. <laughs> and, uh, and so we moved to Blanco and, and lived on a ranch. And uh, anybody here going to get upset if, if I use a bad word or two? No. <laughs> so, so when we got to Blanco, uh, my brother and I, I mean, there was no Boy Scout troop. And uh, there had been in Brownsville. So we went to the Methodist Church and said, you know, would you sponsor um, a Boy Scout troop? And they said, yes, if you can find a Scout Master. So we went to this retired Army Colonel. Now, that gives you an image right there. <laughs> So, and we asked him if he would, if he would be the scoutmaster, and he said he would. So, we started, started a troop. Methodist Church was the sponsor. Uh, we were going to have our first camp out. In Blanco, if you were 10 or 11, you could drive. I mean, it, no, <laughs> trucks, cars, it didn't matter. Um, tractors. But anyway, so... I asked my mom if, you know, had this camp out, and I said, you know, I've got to take this cot and a bedroll, and, you know, can I, can I use, we had no 33 international pickup, and I said, can, can I use the pickup? And she said, yeah, okay. <laughs> so I, I had a few minutes, so I thought, well, I'll drive into town. You know, so <laughs> I put my arm on the windowsill to make my muscle push out. And drove into town and drove by Phyllis's house. <laughs> you know, drove by Patsy's house. <laughs> drove by Rita's house. <laughs> and so on. And then I looked at my watch and I was 30 minutes late for the camp out. So I went to the Girl Scout camp, which is where we were going to have the camp. And the scoutmaster, Colonel Forsythe, was lecturing everybody in around the flagpole. And when I got out of the old pickup, I mean, he landed on me that how irresponsible I was and thoughtless and I mean, he just absolutely let me have it in front of all my friends. And of course he was right. But anyway, when finally when he finished and he turned, I said, fuck stick, like that. <laughs> <laughs> and he turned around. <laughs> and I mean, he shut it down. I mean, he, he shut me down. He shut the Boy Scout troop down. <laughs> he shut the camp out down. I mean, and Blanco did not have a Boy Scout troop until, again, until I was like out of college two years. <laughs> so, anyway. <laughs> Billy, just uh, what do you think back on that and your mom and what an important influence she was in your life? What, what did, have you taken away from her and what she did uh, in raising you, you, you boys? Well, I, I can tell you. I mean, mother was from a rural background, as I said, no education, not even a high school education. 
no money, any bad stuff. Uh, but she never said to my brother or me, you can't do that. I mean, Jim would say, I want to I wanna be a biologist, she'd say. That's what you choose, you can do it. You know, and I would go and say, well, I want to build a boat. You know, and she'd say, well, of course, do it, you can do it. I mean, it never occurred to my brother and me ever growing up that if we wanted to do something, that we couldn't do some version of it. And that was the greatest gift, in my view, that any parent could possibly give a child. If she never said, well, you're not old enough for that, or you can't really do that. She always said, yeah, do it. Sure, you can do it. You choose. So. so what about you're going to high school and college at the same time? I'm not sure I did that, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. You were in high school, you were trying to get into college, and so you applied for some courses in college. I did. I did. I, I decided um, Christmas my junior year that, that that was about enough high school for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I checked, and in Blanco, you only had to have 14 credits to get your diploma. Uh, so I said, okay, how can I do that? And you could do it by taking some correspondence courses from the University of Texas. And then I signed up for uh, SMA, San Marcos Baptist Academy, to take Shakespeare and something else. Uh, and if I passed those courses, you know, then I, I wouldn't have to have a senior year in high school. So I asked my mom, could I do this? And she said, sure, if you want to. Um, so then I asked the principal and the superintendent, and uh, they said, no, you can't do that. <laughs> and I said, well, but you know, all, all it takes is 14 credits and, and you get your diploma. And they said, well, not here. And, uh, and the deal was, and I don't want this to sound braggadocious, but I, I was the quarterback and Largely because I was the only one that could remember the plays. <laughs> but, I, but I could remember the plays. And I knew the difference between this play and that play and so on. Um, but they said, no, you can't, you can't do that. So I told my mother. And I mean, my mother put on her hiking boots and she went down to the high school and she said, yes, he can. <laughs> if he wants to, yes, he can. <laughs> so they relented, and then I, I did, in fact, graduate a year early. Um, then, to show how smart I was, I went to five colleges my first year. <laughs> <laughs> I, went to, I went to Texas Tech, but I got Asiatic flu. And I, I was too shy to tell anybody I was sick. And it was in a boarding house. Anyway, I laid there for two weeks just drinking water and sweating. And then when I got well enough to get out of bed, I went to class. I had not the foggiest notion of what I was doing. Anyway, I went from there to San Antonio College. I went from there to uh, Texas State. I went from there to the University of Texas. And that's where I wound up. I'm leaving out when I was going to be an architect. I went to Durham's drafting school. <laughs> so. so while you were at the university, you met J. Frank Doby. And how did he influence your life? Well, here's where that happened. I, I was dating this cute little girl, and she knew I was crazy about Sally, her. cover your ears, please. <laughs> <laughs> I married her. <laughs> um, but... Sally knew that, that I read Dobie and admired Dobie and Son. So on my birthday, she went down and bought me a Dobie book. But also, she went over to Dobie's house and got him to sign it for me. And gave me that for my birthday. And, uh, and you know, urged me to go see Dobie, but I was too shy. But, but finally I did. And I called him and he lived over by the law school on Waller Creek. 
And I called him and asked if I could come by and chat a few minutes and get him to sign a book. And uh, he said, sure. He said, but come after four, he said, because I always take a little siesta. So I was there right at four, knocked on the door, nobody answered. Knocked on the door, nobody answered. Thought, well, maybe he's just gone on an errand. So I sat down on his front steps for a few minutes, knocked on the door, nobody. So I walked around to the back, and there, if, have you guys ever seen a picture of Dobie? You know, he was an old man, white hair, uh, kind of bow-legged. Anyway, um, so he was in the backyard taking a shower bath with a garden hose. He was wearing a <laughs> pair of khaki pants, and he had a little glass of Jack Daniel on the, on the arm of the lawn chair. And um, anyway, so I walked around in back. I, I said, Mr. Doby, and I'm Billy with him. He said, well, come on in. Come on in the house. And there were a, some stairs that went up to this landing. And then from the landing, you went in the house. So he led the way up to the landing. And when he got to the landing, he turned around and looked at me. I was just at the bottom. And he said, are you out at the university? And I said, Yes, sir, I'm in the School of Journalism. He said, Journalism? He said, God damn you, boy. He said, Why don't you take something that'll put fiber in your mind? <laughs> 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 and I mean, it just scared me to death. <laughs> but I went in, and, and we talked about the wild woman of the Navidad, and I told him how much that story had meant to me and that I'd first heard it as an oral tradition and then read it in his book and so on. And um, he had a place in the story where he talked about the wild woman going from farm to farm and, and you know, she could get past the dogs and would steal a pie or something, but she always left something in return. She would even polish a chain and leave but she never took anything, you know. But in the story, he said that she had a way to get past the dogs, but he wasn't going to write it in his story for fear that other people might pick that up, you know. So I asked him, said, how did she get past those dogs? And he said, that is exactly what I do not know. <laughs> 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 he, said, he said, but I couldn't say that. <laughs> but anyway, he, he became a, a dear friend. I mean, and um, he, I think he, he certainly didn't see great intelligence in me, but I, I do think he must have seen passion in me for you know stories in the southwest and texas and so on and i would go over to visit him every chance i get and invariably he would have a paper sack a grocery sack full of stuff that he thought i ought to have and it would be articles that he had written the manuscripts it would be uh, reprints things he had written it would be books it just you know and, and he would i mean it was just as regular as rain. You know, every time I went over, oh, here's something, you better pay attention to this, you know. And it'd be an article, and it would be about the use of the language. And it said, read this, you know, you need to know how to use the language. Always. Always something. What a gift. You know, and to an impressionable kid who had uh, the itch to do something, but, you know, not yet the courage. I mean, to, I mean, what a gift, what a gift. Uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. So, you were a Kappa Sig. <laughs> so, Henry and I were Kappa Sigs. One of my fraternity brothers back there, right there he is. <clears throat> and you Henry were already Sal. showing quite a bit of entrepreneurial skill by your ability to organize regular poker games. Is that right? <laughs> Well, there, there were regular <laughs> poker games, whether I organized them or not. You're not oh, you're not going to confess, huh? <laughs> no, I, I It was, uh, 
And do was not, am I mistaken in saying that Frank Irwin may have been a guest from time to time? But the not chairman of the board of the University of Texas. Yeah. <laughs> but not a but not a happy visitor when he <laughs> when he came. Uh, my roommate and I also had a bar in our room, <laughs> and we and I when I say had a bar, I mean we built a bar, <laughs> and we had a refrigerator, and there was a grocery store across the street, Slaughter's, and you could get them to to shave get, you could get a piece of salami that you could read through <laughs> I mean it was that thin and the same thing with cheese and you put a piece of meat and a piece of cheese between two pieces of bread and you know 12 o'clock midnight you could get 35 cents for that <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and boy we did and, uh, but we also sold Liquor. Yeah. Now, now Frank Irwin would come over, and of course Frank was a grown man and chairman of the board of Texas Board of Regents, and he knew the difference between good whiskey and bad whiskey. But for everybody else, I mean, we had Chevis Regal bottles, and then you know poured cold duck in it or, <laughs> or whatever, and uh, and all and always found willing customers. But Frank came one time and uh, he was very happy to see that at least some portion of us over there had made our grades and we weren't on SCO Pro. So he was going to have a celebratory drink, you know, at our bar, which was called Bar 24, which was the name of the, the number of the room. And uh, so he said, and it was a Chevis Regal bottle. <laughs> and so he poured a drink and we tried to look away, <laughs> and, uh, and he knew that was not Chevis Regal. And I think it was the next week of the, maybe two weeks, but he, sh he shut us down. <laughs> the, so how was your career uh, academically at the University of Texas? How was it or how was it not? <laughs> <laughs> Some of both. Well, actually, there was there was one course. I bet you took it too. That uh, I really did relish, loved. It's I can honestly say it's the only course I took that I just uh, I just couldn't wait to get to class, even though I had a very dull professor. But that was Life and Literature of the Southwest, Life and Literature, yeah. which was a course that J. Frank Dobie had taught. invented. Mm -hmm. And so when he created that course uh, the university said no you you can't have a, that course and uh, Dobie said well why not and and the administration said because there's there's no literature of Texas and Dobie and that's when Dobie said well I'll make it life and literature of Texas he said you can't deny there's life <laughs> so 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 he did, and I, I, I'm sure you loved it too, didn't you? Yeah, for sure. It, it was a great course. Uh, we had some great teachers. Uh, Billy and I share the fact that we grew up in the 40s. Uh, if you're talking about blackout subs, when they thought that the Nazis were attacking or the ships were about, submarines were about to, you know, blow up the harbor and Corpus Christi or, or whatever. But we grew up in the greatest time in America, without a doubt. We saw America at a point that none of this, the rest of us in this room or those that come after us, I should say, will ever see again. But we were blessed just by that experience, don't you think? I do, absolutely. So what got you, after your education at the University of Texas, to start the Encino Press? What was the uh, inspiration for that? Well, Sally was teaching in Dallas, so I, I moved to Dallas it's just before we got married. Isn't it, Sally? Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, see, <laughs> I, I always got somebody to check with. <laughs> anyway, um, trying to put all the 
places back to back. We went to Dallas and I, my first job was with the SMU Press. And that way I was around books and I learned how to make books and so on by working for the SMU Press. And then I decided, or Sally and I decided, that we wanted to publish books on our own, you know. So um, that's when I wrote Dobie and said, would you let us make a little book out of Bob Moore, Man and Birdman? Bob Moore was a panhandle uh, foreman on a ranch, but he had an absolute passion from the time he was a boy for birds and bird nests and it, bird eggs, you know, and, uh, and he became one of the leading ornithologists and oologists uh, in the world living out on this ranch because he studied bird nests, bird eggs, and all that. So, so first Dobie wrote me and he said, no, he said, I've already got a publisher. And he said, a writer can scatter his brand too much. And um, so I think not. Well, Dobie had written one time that if a man doesn't change his mind on occasion, then he need, need no longer be counted among the living. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll quote Dobie to Dobie. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I wrote the letter, but I thought, you know, don't be a fool. <laughs> don't send that letter. So I didn't send it. But a week later, I got a letter from Dobie he said, I've been rethinking your proposal uh, to publish Bob Moore, Man and Birdman. And he said, it's, it's all right. And he said, do it. He said, I'll write a new introduction uh, anyway. And then he died the next week. Um, but we did publish it. Um, and that started the Encino Press. And um, I, of course, I know you have all those books. But anyway, How, what was the final head count on the number of publications? Do you remember? Somewhere just a bit over a hundred, I think. Mm -hmm. They're beautiful books. Uh, they're collectible. A lot of people just collect Billy's works, try to find everything he did. And he's got some fairly obscure things too. If you very, look around, very <laughs> obscure. never meant For a to be reason, obscure. <laughs> Uh, but how did you go from that into screenwriting and uh, producing movies? I was sitting at my desk um, at the Encino, and um, the Encino was cooking. I don't mean cooking huge, <laughs> but I right. mean it was bubbling. And we were eating off it. And I was sitting at my desk, and I thought, God Almighty, I thought, you know, today is just like yesterday, and tomorrow is going to be like today. And I, and I just felt like, God, you know, I, something to light a new fire, you know. And um, but we, I was working on a, a book, a visual history of Dallas with A.C. Green, and uh, I was going back and forth, back and forth to Dallas trying to buy this collection of glass plate negatives of Dallas <coughs> scenes from the turn of the century. And um, as I was going one time, I started thinking of this story my grandfather told me. And because I was driving, it started coming to me in images. And every time I would get in the car to chase those glass plate negatives, you know, I'd forget about it. Then I'd get in the car to drive back to Austin, pick it up again. And after about a month and a half, I had seen a whole story in pictures, in images. So when I sat down to write it, I wrote it as a movie. Though at that time, I'd never seen a film script. So I wrote it as a movie the next day. It's, you know, here's one of the great secrets of the universe as far as I'm concerned. Whatever you're looking for is looking for you too. You just have to recognize it when it pops up in front of you. But anyway, I finished it. The next day, my friend Bud Strake, who had written a movie, who was a, a writer for Sports Illustrated and Atlantic and any Harper's and so on. He was a great guy. And Bud came over and it was 
on the edge of my desk. And he said, what is this? And I said, I mean, he said, oh, you're writing movies. And I said, well, I'm just fooling around. And he said, let me read it. So he took it and, and overnight, and he called me the next morning, and he said, this damn thing will sell. And I said, how? And he said, let me send it to my agent. Now, his agent was a lady named Cindy Degner, whose husband was Sterling Lord, who was, at that time, one of the most prominent literary agents in the country. Well, anyway, she read it. She wrote me a two-page letter, and she hated it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean a little bit. <laughs> I mean, for two pages, <laughs> she just scalded me. <laughs> you know, you didn't do this, you don't know, you should have, and so on. And so I wrote her, I'm arrogant, I wrote, him, I wrote her a letter and said I appreciated her criticism, but I wasn't looking for a critic, I was looking for a salesman. <laughs> so she instantly wrote me back and she said, I have two screenwriters that I represent. Um, she said they've just made a movie that's done very well, which was The French Connection. And this was Phil... Phil D'Antoni and I've forgotten the other guy's name. Um, so she said, may I send your script to them, you know, and they'll tell you. So I said, sure. So she sent it to them. You know, they got, they read it. They wrote back. They wanted to make a series out of it. They loved it. <laughs> so they called me and uh, said, you know, we'll make this. We have a deal with CBS. Um, but you have to move to L.A. And we had a child. And I said, no, I won't move to L.A. And then the next day they'd call and they'd say, we'll do this. You know, you just have to move to L.A. And it's, no, I won't move to L.A. And the th third, three days would go by and they'd call and say, look, we'll do this. We've got a deal. You know, but you have to be out here to write, you know, episodes. And I said, no. Anyway, this went on for a couple of weeks. And... Uh, and then I didn't hear from them again. <laughs> and, uh, but, but then I learned that that's the showbiz deal. You only, you, know, you only get that phone call you know, when it's possibility. Nobody wastes a dime on the bad news. You, know, you just figure that out yourself. Anyway, uh, but I thought, you know, I can write a movie script. So I started writing movie scripts not having the vaguest notion of what I was doing. And, uh, but I would go to movies and I'd watch them a couple of times. And first time for me to see what was going on and the second time to see how the audience was reacting. And you can tell absolutely when a, when a movie's got the audience and when it lets them go. You know, if they start breathing again and coughing and so on, you know you've You've lost them, which I learned for real, <laughs> you know, other times. Um, but anyway, I just started writing them, and, and um, I wrote one called Barbarossa. I wrote one called Raggedy Man, which was about my mother and brother and me and Gregory during the telephone days. Um, anyway, I, one day I... I it got the opportunity to go with a couple of different agencies who had read these scripts. One of them was the biggest agency in the world. The other one was a small one, not a big reputation. But I went with the small one because I knew I was going to screw up in a lot of places. And I wanted to screw up in a place where it wouldn't kill my chances. So I went with the small one. They sold Raggedy Man. Um, what happened to Barbarossa? Huh? Barbarossa, didn't Nil Willie Nelson have something yeah, to do Willie. with Willie? So Barbarossa? this was a story that my grandfather had told me. And uh, anyway, so I wrote it as a script. Um, I, think, I think somebody told Willie about it, and, and Willie and I were friends. And Willie said, what's that movie you're writing? And I said, well, it's called Barbarossa. And it's about this this guy uh, who is a legendary figure to this family of Mexicans in South Texas. 
He said, oh, I'd like to see that. And Willie was just getting really big with his singing and everything. So I took it out to him and we were up in his bedroom and, and you know, he took it and he literally opened it and he looked at it for three minutes and he said, I want to be that guy. And I said, okay, now let's see if somebody will put up the money. And somebody did. And, um, and Willie was that guy. And, and it was just great fun to make it with Willie. There was a little bit of um, problems with the co-star. That was Gary Busey, who was <laughs> crazy as nine snakes in a basket. <laughs> but, but, anyway, but, it was, but that was fun too. So anyway, Barbarossa came out. Then we made Raggedy Man at the same time, as it turned out, with Sissy Spacek and Sam Shepard, both of who became lifelong friends. Um, you know, and it just... What about Legend of the Falls? Legends of the Fall, God. Um, John Graves actually is the one who showed me that story. And I thought it was magnificent. So I tried to option it myself. But it was already optioned by somebody in New York who was planning to make a movie of it. But they never made a movie of it. But they held it so you couldn't buy it. And... Um, Anyway, finally, he lost the option. The studio knew I was chasing it. And also that a young director named Ed Zwick, who later won an Academy Award, uh, was chasing it too. And he put us together and he said, you know, he directs you right and y'all make a deal. So we did. And again, talk about luck. I mean, it got made and everything. Uh, because of the cast, you know, and but you can always get a cast with the with good material, you know. But it's that's what attracts good good performers, good actors. And whatever possibly motivated you to write Perfect Storm? Where did you even come up with the idea? I got I didn't. That's a book by Sebastian Junger, and. Uh, so I got a, this is going to lead into a pretty good story. So I got a call one day from TriStar, and they said, we have, we have bought Sebastian Younger's Perfect Storm, and would you like to write the script? Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah. And I had a read the book, and I said, yeah. I said, who's the director? And they said, Wolf, Wolfgang Peterson. Now, Wolf, Wolfgang Peterson's a German guy, and uh, he had written, or he had directed and produced a movie called Das Boot, which, which is a terrific, terrific movie. So anyway, so I went to L.A., we talked, and so on and whatnot, and uh, I, wrote a, I wrote a draft and went back to uh, L.A. to have my meeting with the director, and I had a, a line in there. There was a scene where, I mean, they had not been catching any fish. The, the story is about a sword boat, and they're trying to catch swordfish. And what happens to them when uh, they run into the worst storm of the century, really. And uh, so anyway, but in the part, in the script, where they're not catching any fish, the crew is really getting upset and, uh, and complaining a lot. And so on. And there's a scene where all the crew is down in uh, the galley. And they are bitching and mad and so on because they only get paid if they catch fish. And finally, one of them says, Here again, you got, I, I, I've stepped into this one. I, there's going to be a little bit of bad words here, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, so they're. they're in there and uh, and this character named Bugsy said Skipper couldn't catch a fish it was hanging on to his dick with both hands <laughs> and, 
That is, that's funny. I wish you'd been there. <laughs> because the director didn't like it at all. He said, Bill, he said, what's this? I, I said, I said, that's a funny line. He said, yeah, that's funny. I said, I said, Wolfgang, that's a funny line. I said, people are going to laugh. He said, Bill, fish don't have hands. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and I knew that line was out of the movie. It? It, it, was, it was never going to be in that movie. And it never was, but it was a funny line. <laughs> so, if, we, if you don't mind, would you just briefly tell the audience about your experiences when you were driving with Willie Nelson, I think it was to Corpus, to some event, and he was explaining his situation with the IRS and what, what, what he had to say about it. Okay, I'm hesitating a second because I, there are several chapters of this story and I don't want to. So, we're driving, we're actually driving to South Padre and Willie's going to write music for Redheaded Stranger. And uh, so we're driving along and, and uh, I said, boy, Willie, your, your career's really booming, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and he it. says, yeah. He said, everything's really going great. Uh, he said, he do said, you know how much I made last year? I said, no. He said, I mean, after I pay the gasoline, after I pay the band, you know, after I pay for the weed. <laughs> he said, he said, do you know how much I made? And he said, I said, no. He said, $2 million. I said, $2 million? He said, yeah. I said, you ever just sit back and say, God damn. He said, every goddamn day. <laughs> 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 so what about your photographic career so uh, about the same time just before I started fooling with the movies uh, I got a chance to go to Mexico and photograph Mexican vaqueros Joe France who was a famous historian at UT called me and he said, I'm going to Mexico. He said, you want to go to Mexico and uh, go to this ranch? And I said, sure. And uh, then he called me a couple hours. He said, bring your camera. So, so <laughs> I'm boring <laughs> the dog. Anyway, so um, I took my camera. We went down to El Rancho Tule, which was 350,000 acres without a cross fence and uh, and I started taking pictures and I realized I was seeing a world that had gone by in this country you know a half a century before and so on so I just became totally enraptured and uh, so when I got back to Austin and developed my film and so on and it was not particularly good. But I called the ranch manager down there and said, you know, would you permit me to come back and, uh, you know, go with the vaqueros and camp out and all that stuff and take pictures? And he said, okay. So I did that for a, a little over three years, back and forth, back and forth, you know. And, uh, and it was like being in a time machine. And I mean, and, and it was it, it's just wonderful stuff. Walking down a Sendero one morning with two cameras. I mean, just about where you are, sir. Uh, a panther stepped out of the cactus and just walked right in front of me like that. It never looked at me. I never slowed down my step. And we just crossed like that. But it was, it was always something like that. It was just magic. The foreman was this wonderful man named Russell Dorwood. And, uh, and really a great guy. But he stayed interested in what was going on in the Texas and in the United States. 
And so when I would get there, he would just quiz me. Well, is Texas going to win football games this year? <laughs> I said, nobody knows. You know, but I mean, he was always wanting to song. But one day he said, he said, Bill, is it true that all those kids at the university are smoking that marijuana? And I said, it, it is true. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, what would you say? 40, 50 percent? I said, no, I'd say 80, 90 percent. And he said, he thought about it. And we're eating and, and uh, he said, well, let me tell you something. He said, anybody who tells you that stuff doesn't make you crazy, he said, is just wrong. And then he started eating again. And I said, is that right, Russell? He said, yeah, that is right. And he started eating again. And I said, well, you, you know that because of what? And he said, well, when I first come down to old Mexico, he said, I had a run in with an old boy all popped up on that stuff. And um, he said, he came at me. And he said, I wrapped a 30-30 around his forehead and he just kept coming. And then he started eating. <laughs> and of course, I'm waiting for the rest of the story. And I said, well, that's, that sounds pretty interesting, Russell. And he said, it is. <laughs> well, that's all he ever said about it. <laughs> so, but that, the, oh, you were you the, go ahead. The, about the boys then? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. So, I was working on but this movie. Which one of those trips down to? The ranch, did you stop in Laredo? Or did that come after? That, that? was a, that after. a different time, yeah. Okay. A different time. But I was writing a movie called A Night No Mexico, which we finally did make with Robert Duvall. And part of it took place in Boys Town in Nuevo Laredo, which of course is where all the uh, houses of El Repute are. It's a separate little city outside of town. And um, so I... And I had a whole sequence of scenes through there. So I went down there and I had my camera and uh, went to Boys Town. And uh, my thought was to take some pictures would be good research. And uh, so I went down there and I had no trouble with the cameras uh, except they wouldn't let me use flash. And as a consequence, I didn't get any pictures. Um, so the next morning I went back just at, you know, early morning, eight o'clock, whatever. Boys Town was, a cl was one little closed in town. There was one way in and that was a gate that was controlled by the Federales. And that was the only way out. And there were just streets and the streets were, you know, houses of prostitution everywhere. That's what it was. And uh, so I was walking down the street and, you know, I took a picture just of the street and so on. Walked down a little ways. And there was one of the ladies that was sweeping off her front porch of this little cell, really. And I turned and, and took one picture. And she heard the click of the shutter. And she turned on me, you goddamn gringo. And anyway, just let me have it. And then, I mean, on both sides of the street, they came out of the houses and grabbed rocks and sticks. And when I say rocks, I don't mean marble size. I mean like a peach. And just let me have it. And they were right. I mean, I was there to steal their lives. And in the morning, their lives were theirs. They weren't for sale, you know. And it was this deal where um, you walk just fast enough to keep moving through there. You know if you run... They're going to get you. And you know if you walk too slow, they're going to get you. But anyway, so I walked on down the street and so on. And um, anyway, then I, I came back that night and I fell in with the photographers that go from house to house, table to table. And for two bucks, they'll take a picture of you and your drunk friend, you know, sitting with some prostitutes. I mean, they're party pictures. And so on. But anyway, I was in this place 
and uh, there were some of those photographers in there that they saw my cameras, you know. So we had a beer, and uh, nice guys. And uh, anyway, they said, we want to show you something. So we went down the street, down an alley, down an alley, down the street, so on. And we come to this little, it's no more than a room, really. And there's one guy sitting in there with an old rusted enlarger and three or four pans of chemicals, you know. And the deal is, they would take a roll of film, cut it into little pieces, lay it behind the shutter, go out, shoot one picture, run back to this little place, give the, take the piece of film out, hand it to this guy. He would develop it, he would fix it, he would wash it, he would wipe it on his leg, you know, stick it in the enlarger, you know, and he'd make one print and uh, and do, run it through the same chemicals, you know, and um, and then take the print and blow dry it with a hair dryer and uh, staple it in a little frame. And the photographer would run back to the whorehouse and for two bucks, you know, sell that picture. And so there was a little stack of those cut negatives and I peeled one of them off the top. They were all stuck together because they had been wet and held it up to the light. I said, my God, you know, this is a portrait of a subworld that no gringo could ever take. And it wasn't what, that they were dirty pictures, they were human pictures. And they just, it just incredible stuff. So I said, how much? You know, quantum spaces? No, 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 no. Federales would cut our throats. I said, yeah, but for history, for posterity. They said, well, maybe for money. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, I, so I, I bought a stack of their negatives that night and took them back to my hotel and washed them in the sink and then could look at each one. It was just in, incredible, incredible stuff. And um, I made a deal, I went back, made a deal with those guys to buy their negatives every week. And I had a friend, he would go and he would get them anyway. And put them on a bus, I'd get them in Austin, rewash them, refix them, so on. Wound up with 7,000 some odd um, pictures. And, and we published a book called Boys Down. Billy, what do you take away from your career in photography? What, what is the thing about it that's been most gratifying? Um, the thing that's most gratifying to me is, is you, you have a visual history, you know, and, you know, photography, speaking historically, you know, is still, is still pretty recent. We're going to finish here pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> you were right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, uh, before photography, the only people who had a visual past were people who could afford to have a painter. Right. You know, and when photography came along, I mean, everybody could have a visual past. You know, they could see their family going back. And um, so, I mean, it's, that's. That's the magic for me. Let's uh, sort of end our discussion um, with you recounting uh, your experiences uh, with Lonesome Dove, which is arguably um, the finest uh, screen or movie adaptation of a book ever done. And Lonesome <laughs> Dove is without doubt um, one of the finest historical novels ever written certainly about the settlement of the West. And I've got to say that Billy could not have captured better um, what Larry McMurtry had to say about that event. And I've never seen anyone who was absolutely so given to protecting what, what McMurtry wrote, to truly reflecting it properly and not trying to write his own history of or story of Lonesome Dove. So with that said, um, 
tell us about your experiences because they were certainly unique. And start, well, if you would, whatever you want to say, but don't forget to tell us about how you selected the cast, okay? Well, let me tell the story ahead of that. Sure. So we, we had a deal with CBS to do a mini series of Larry's book. Um, anyway, in the, in the ins and outs of getting to that point are myriad. Um, but just so the audience knows, Larry refused to do it, right? Uh, you mean to write it? Yes. He didn't want to write it. I don't, I'm not sure they asked him to write it. They might have, I don't know. But when they offered it to me, I called Larry and said, you know, you sure you don't want to do this? He said, no, I don't want to do it. I've, you know, I've had enough of it. And, um, and I did want to do it. So I, I said I would. Uh, my partner was Suzanne DePass, who at that time was president of Motown Pictures. And Suzanne's the one that got me involved. And um, so um, I wrote, it took a year to write the script. I wrote the script. Uh, we sent it to CBS. Uh, and we were waiting for CBS to give us the first response. And Suzanne called me and she said, you've got to get out here. And I said, what's the problem? And she, she said, CBS is talking like they're not going to, they're not going to produce it. They're not going to do it. And I said, why? And she said, it's the budget. I said, the budget? Anyway, she said, you better get out here. So I flew to LA and uh, Suzanne, and I, Suzanne and I went over to CBS. And uh, there was a room full of, of executives. And uh, so we go in and I, I say, what's the trouble? And they say, it's, it costs too much. The budget's way too high. And I said, well, I mean, you know, it's it, nothing particularly special why it should cost so much. And one of them said, it's those cattle. It's all those damn, <laughs> it's all those cattle. And I said, well, but, but you, you know, the story is these Texas cowboys down on the Rio Grande, you know, gather up this herd of cattle and uh, they drive them to Montana. And uh, they're the first herd of cattle that go to Montana. And that's what the story is. I said, well, the cattle cost too much. And I said, well, but th that's what the story is. And you, and, you pretty much have to have the cow. <laughs> and, and one of them said, not necessarily, Bill. Yeah. And I, I said, I beg for it. And he said, you know that scene, he said, where they're, they've just started riding along and they've got the cattle. And he said, and that storm comes up. And I said, yeah. And he said, and lightning flashes and thunder booms and it starts raining and dust and everything. I said, yeah. And he said, and the cows start running. I said, they stampede, yeah. And he said, hell, just let them go. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you're writing the dialogue. And he said, you know, just, just have Paul turn to, to Gus and say, well, there went our cattle. <laughs> and, he said, and then you have Gus say, yeah, but we're already on the way, so let's just keep going. <laughs> and, uh, and so I thought they were joking. So I said, or, I said, there is a way we can do this with no cattle. And they said, how's that? And I said, goats. I said, well, these guys can be the first guys <laughs> to drive a herd of Angora goats to Montana. <laughs> you know, and uh, one of them slapped me, he says, goats, that's perfect. <laughs> and, and I said, don't know why, I'm, I'm, I'm teasing, I'm teasing, and so on. Uh, but what we did, we, we bought our own herd of cattle, and then we used them for the whole show, you know, and filmed them and everything. And by the time we had finished filming, the market had gone up and we sold our cattle and made money. <laughs> so.
Lonesome Dove, though, was, uh, you know, just a, a great event. And, uh, and Larry had his thumb on something um, that was heart deep. It just was. I mean, I, I don't know how he did it, but it's there. I mean, people recognize themselves in it. They recognize their grandparents in it, their fathers, their uncles. It's just so much, so much a part of the fabric of our history now. I mean, uh, just amazing. I mean, I'm sure all those characters are as familiar to you as some of your own blood. You know, I mean, it's where it, it's it's where we want to believe we came from from people like that. Well, tell us about the real people in the movie and how you were able to cast them. Meaning the actors and everything? Correct. Um, Especially Gus and Carl. Well, of course, I knew Duval, Duval and I've known Tommy Lee forever. And um, may I go back and tell? So... Um, so when we started negotiating uh, a contract when I was going to write it, I, I wanted to have mutual creative control because I'd been in enough deals where if the studio has all the control or the network has all the control, that it, it can be a mess because their interest is not always in making the best movie you can make but rather putting the most butts and seats in front of screens or, you know, and how they define that is often very different than how the people who make the movie might define it. So when we started talking about my deal, I said, you know, I, I, I want part of my deal to be mutual creative control. So they talked and they wrangled back and forth, but CBS absolutely would not do it, but I wouldn't do it without that. And uh, finally one day, uh, I got a call from uh, the president of, or the head of business affairs at CBS. And uh, he said, now Bill, like we'd been over friends. He said, now Bill. <laughs> he, said, uh, he, said, he said, you know CBS is not going to give you mutual creative control. You know, they're never going to give a writer that. And I said, no, I know it. And he said, okay, well, then you'll do it. And I said, no, I won't do it. And anyway, we'd go back and forth, back and forth. And finally, after a while, he said, he said, I just don't understand this. He said, why are you being so hard-headed? He said, you know, you, you've written movies before. You've made movies before. He said, why are you, why are you being so stubborn? And I said, I said, actually, I can tell you. I said, number one, I said, Larry McMurtry's a friend of mine. I said, his book is a Bible down here where I live. And, um, and the story is about the people we come out of and so on. And I said, and I said it's going to take me a year to write the script. And I said, and, and because of all those things about the book and what it's about, I said, I'm going to strive to really make a good script. And... I, I can tell you it's going to be a good script. And I said, but basically, I don't want to go through all of that and have you guys come behind me and cast Dom DeLuise and Jim Neighbors <laughs> as, as Gus and Carl. <laughs> and there was this long silence. And then he started giggling. And he said, okay. He said, I hear you. And so they caved in. And some of it did get that crazy. I mean, um, I can tell this here, but um, well, I got a big pressure on casting Burt Reynolds as Jake, you know. And they would call and say, well, you know, Burt Reynolds, and he'll do it. And I said, I, you know, I, look, here's the problem. I said, if we cast Burt Reynolds, that's who we get, you know, that he'll be Burt Reynolds. And we don't want Burt Reynolds. We want Jake. Anyway, this, this, 
it's got to be a roaring problem for several weeks. I said, well, we'll fly him down to Austin. He said, you'll like him. And I said, I will like him. And I said, no, you know, we'll go somewhere we can see a fist fight. I said, he, he, we can buy him some beer. I said, anything you like. And I said, then I'll put him on an airplane to go back and I'll tell him that I had told you seven times. <laughs> seven times, you know, that I wasn't going to, you know, I wasn't going to cast him. And then you deal with him. But anyway. So. Billy, uh, when you look over the cast past uh, uh, Tommy Lee Jones and Duvall, who um, are you happiest about in, of the selection you made? Who would be the next actor that you would say that was really a good choice? Well, if you go through the Hat Creek outfit, I mean, you know, Robert Duvall absolutely was the right choice. I oh. mean, he's one of our four or five greatest actors in the history of film. Um, Tommy Lee was absolutely the right guy. Um, let me, may I tell one quick story? Sure, please. So Tim used to write, you know who I'm talking about, he's got to play P.I. And um, so Tim used to ride with me out to the set every morning. And we would stop at this 7-Eleven and get a cup of coffee to go. And uh, one morning we stopped at the 7-Eleven. And they had those little uh, cardboard cameras. Had a stack of those on the counter. And uh, Tim looked at me and asked the lady, said, what are those? And uh, she said, those are disposable cameras. Tim said, what? She said, they're disposable cameras. She said, you know, you just throw them away. And Tim said, oh. He said, how much are they? And she said, they're $4.95. And he said, well, let me have one. So she gave him a camera. He gave her the money, threw it in the trash. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we walked out. <laughs> he was so funny. I tell you. God, he was funny. <laughs> but, you know... All of those guys, I mean, they're, I was thin on a couple of them. Um, I, worried, I worried about Newt the whole time because Ricky, you know, was just 16, I think, or 15. Mm -hmm. And that part, that character, you know, has, has to go from being a boy to being enough of a man that you believe Woodrow Call would leave that ranch in his charge. You know, and I worried about that. We couldn't find anybody else. So we we cast Ricky. And then at the moment when we started bringing actors into Austin, you know, to make sure they could ride a horse and get their costumes and all that, uh, I got a call. And it was some of the guys out at uh, a staging point, you know. And he said, Bill, you got you got to get out here. And I said, what's the problem? He said, uh, oh, Bill, just, just you got to get out here. So I went out there, and I saw the problem right away. Ricky was wearing one of those masks like painters use because he was allergic to horses. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, my God, what have we done? <laughs> but then Tommy Lee and Duval walked up, and that mask... You know, I mean, nobody wanted to look bad in front of Tommy Lee Jones and Robert Duvall. And we never heard another word ever about being allergic to horses. <laughs> tell you one more quick story. Yeah, there is. Uh, tell, tell us, before we leave, tell us uh, uh, one of your favorite stories from most of the part of your adventure there. Okay. But let me tell, talking about the mask. So when we were making Barbarossa, Gary Busey, played the, side, the sidekick, you know. And Gary rode a horse like this. <laughs> and I was, when we first got there and they put Gary on a horse, I was standing by this old wrangler who, excuse me, had been in the movies going back to the silent days. 
and he was just watching and Gary came right uh -huh. behind and he looked and he said, you know, Bill, he said, it looks like somebody just shit in the saddle and turned a horse loose. <laughs> 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 um, I, the thing that I, I, I think that got me was Gus's death scene. Mm -hmm. You know, that was, I think it was 16 minutes. I mean, it's, it's written just one scene, those two guys, 16 minutes. And, you know, and pulling on what Larry had in the book which was both the humor of those two guys, the warmth of those two guys and as far as their friendship is concerned, and they're dealing with life and death, and it's the last moment. And it is just so powerful in Larry's book, and it is so powerful uh, the way it is played between Tommy Lee and Duval. It is, I think, one of the great scenes ever filmed, you know. I think you're absolutely right, it, and I would further say that one of the great things about that book, which you captured so magnificently, is it's really truly about how men relate to each other yeah. in life and how they can develop warm affections, but they have a hard time talking about it or demonstrating it, other than commitment to something that they're told to do or promised to do. Um, and I think that scene you just talked about reflects that as well as any. These are two men trying to say they love each other. They're just not going to get the words out. Yeah. And it's beautifully played. You know, just beautifully played. So, um, anything else about the movie that you would like to mention? Um, could I? This might be a little long, and it's in a slightly different vein. Uh, my dear, dear friend, Tim Scott, who played P.I., was from New Mexico. And he was raised on Navajo radio. You know, so if you're driving, even today, if you drive through New Mexico and you're on one of the Navajo stations, you know, they'll say, hey, yeah, yeah, Coca-Cola. You know, hey, yeah, or Ford Automobile, or whatever. And Tim could do that buried in, in Los Angeles. And anyway, he was feeling real bad about that because he didn't know where his carcass was going to go. And uh, I said, well, Tim, I, and he had told me he wanted to be cremated. So I said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. I said, you know, after the cremation, you know, we'll take your ashes out to our ranch where Tim had fly fished and so on. And, uh, and, and he loaded it. And I said, and we'll scatter your ashes. And I told him where. And and he said, that would be great. And then, you know, and he was fine with that and so on. So um, sure enough, Tim died. He was cremated. We scattered his ashes, a lot of his ashes out on our ranch. And uh, then I took two little 35 millimeter film canisters and I took uh, and filled them with ashes. And I told Tim, I said, you know, you're going to be here, but I'm also going to take a few of your ashes to Santa Fe and then a few to the river, the San Juan River, where we had fly fish to go. And he was, <laughs> he, he was pleased with that. So anyway, so Tim died. We scattered his ashes on our place. Next morning, I had those two cassettes of ashes and I drove to Santa Fe, and uh, the next morning, I went out to the obelisk there in the plaza, and uh, took one little cassette of ashes and scattered it around the obelisk, which is, incidentally, uh, against the federal law, <laughs> and, uh, which, which I didn't know at the time, but I thought Tim would appreciate that, too. But anyway, <laughs> after that, then, I started driving to the Four Corners, you know, and um, and going to go to the San Juan, and after I got after uh, got out of Bernalillo, you know, you're driving, and all of a sudden the the landscape just opens up. It's just a huge 
wide open prairie that goes on forever in every direction. And I came over this little hill and I looked down and there was a Navajo woman with a, a scarf and a blanket over her shoulders just walking down the highway. And so as I got to her, I thought, you know, I ought to stop and give her a ride. So I stopped and I walked around and I said, um, can, can I take you somewhere? She didn't say anything. She just moved. She got right in the car. I helped her up, closed the door, got back in the car. And, and I said, ma'am, I, I, is, there, is there someplace I can take you? And she said, hey, yeah, oh, Shiprock. <laughs> 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 no, no kidding. <laughs> and, uh, and so I st started driving, and I had a little point-and-shoot camera on the console, and I, and I, I was driving. And I said, "Tim, is that you?" <laughs> and she didn't say anything. She didn't look at me. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> and I drove off. I said, "Seriously, Tim, is that is that <laughs> is that you?" She didn't say anything. But I took my camera. And I mean, and I clicked off seven or eight pictures and they look like, she looks like Tim. She's got that hook nose. She's got the high cheekbones and everything. <laughs> when I got to Farmington, I said, you know, I'm going to take a left here and go to the San Juan. Is, is, where, where can I take you? She said, post office. So I took her to the post office. Why not? <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> Billy, if, if we can... Um, there, you made reference to it how we always use in large measure the place we live to write about or to paint um, and it really says as much about ourselves as it does about the people that we're writing about or painting about or whose lives we're capturing with photographs. If you look over the body of your career, your work over these many years what is the one thing that you would point to that best expresses you and it's the finished product? Um, probably my high school letter jacket. No, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> You know, I think the collection that Sally and I started at, at Texas State. Which tell is, them about that a little bit. Well, it's, you know, JP and I are kindred spirits. Um, you know, JP, this has been JP's life, really, and, and, and will be. And we are all the beneficiaries of it. I mean, it is a great collection, beautifully shown, beautifully cared for and stewarded. And it's... It, 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 like we were talking about Lonesome Dove, it's also where we all come from, you know, and we should revere it and so on. And Sally and I have done something like this at Texas State University. There, um, you know, we have a book, books and photographs and now music, and we're going to do film and television as well. Um, for example, Steve Harrigan, somewhere here we have Steve's archives. We have Cormac McCarthy's. We've got a lot of Dobie stuff, not all of it. Um, <coughs> Sam Shepard, a world of Sam stuff. Uh, recently, Mary Carr's stuff, which is your heritage too. Um, and all these things were acquired through the efforts of Sally and Bill. I mean, they really identified the people whose collections were meaningful uh, that McCormick, uh, you were after him years before. Yeah, uh, 20 years. Already recognized, Billy was very early to recognize his particular genius. But it's like, but that, and I'm sure that's got to be true with you, JP, because you, you know, you, you know what it means. And you know you're blessed that some of these things came across, came across your plate. And yes, that's true. But, you know, the thing I've been most blessed about, not just stuff here, but the fact that people can get enjoyment out of it, 
And I was more blessed by meeting people like you. <laughs> and what did you all think about this? Uh... <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Good. Would anybody here consider being the scoutmaster in <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if anybody, I don't want to uh, drag this on, Chalk's getting very anxious, but uh, <laughs> let's say we could have maybe three or four or five questions from the audience if somebody has anything particularly uh, that they would like to ask. Go, Billy. Right over here. Well, Sally gave me that but book. Was it, his, a book. It was, yeah, his. I was just curious which book of his. I'll tell you a tale. That's the name of it. I'll tell you a tale. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Um, Richard obviously put in a lot of research into this story, not just on the personal side, but on the historical side. Did you do more research, or did you pretty much take his word for detail? For which? For a looks and done. When you when you wrote the screenplay, did you go back and do even more research, or did you just? No, I. You know, Larry's book was a bible for me, right. and I wanted to do Larry's version of his book, right. you know, and make a film of that. I mean, I didn't try to one up McMurtry, you know. Um, I think my, my question was more about what are the differences between screenwriting and novelization? Um, well, screenwriting, you, you don't have time to explain. Mm -hmm. You have to do it um, through what the characters say back and forth, you know. And, and you can't tell the reader or the viewer, the background. You just have to, you have to do it in such a way that it, that, that you get a, the Great talking. Thank you. Thank you.